So the role and the purpose of the census in the United States is to uh, conduct a census every 10 years. It was deemed important from the Founding Fathers. It's part of our Constitution in the United States, uh, which is a little bit unique because most countries don't have that kind of requirement in their constitutions. Um, the use of the data is at first and foremost to uh, apportion the members of Congress uh, in the House of Representatives, and those numbers are apportioned to each state. Another aspect of the uh, importance of the data is that it's used for many, many different purposes, uh, planning, decision making, it's used for education, it's used for all sorts of purposes. Um, and some of those purposes include the dissemination of uh, federal dollars as part of federal programs uh, to state, local, and tribal governments. And that adds up to about $400 billion a year that are allocated to those branches of government or those lower level governments uh, based on the results of the census. The next census in the United States is going to be in 2020. And this is a census that's going to have more change than the last many decades. Um, and these changes are really quite exciting and they're very innovative. Using technology to uh, manage our whole field infrastructure. Uh, you can imagine that conducting a census is the largest civilian activity that occurs in the United States. In the 2010 census, we hired over 600,000 people to find the folks that did not respond to the last census. And in those cases, we do that over a very short period of time because we only have so much time to actually tabulate the data and deliver that to the President of the United States. So in order to conduct that field work, uh, we have to make assignments and we have to give direction and we have to have uh, various levels of supervisory control to be sure that the job is done well. With mobile technology, with geospatial data, uh, with uh, navigation information, with workflow management, all of those factors are playing into the field re-engineering component for the census. And so now uh, we don't necessarily have to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with supervisors and field listers to go out and do that work or field enumerators. Uh, they can get, uh, receive their assignments uh, that are pushed to them via the internet and via the wireless environment. And so, so there are many changes that are occurring as part of that activity. And I think that this is really an exciting place for where we will uh, reduce the levels of management, that we reduce the levels of field staff that are required to do the work, and therefore uh, there'll be significant cost avoidance as a result of that operation. If you go back to the 2010 census, it was over $12 billion to conduct the census. Uh, if we were to do it the same way in 2020, it would be over $17 billion. And we believe with the changes in these four innovation areas, um, improving the, uh, the re-engineering of the address canvassing operation, checking that list. Secondly, giving more options, one uh, instead of one, three options for filling out the form. Uh, the third area of using existing administrative data from other organizations, other agencies. Uh, and the last is a field reinfrastructure where we're talking about streamlining our field operations. Uh, we estimate that the cost avoidance would be approximately $5 billion uh, in savings so that we get close to the cost of what the 2010 census costs in 2020. So I think that's quite an achievement if we're able to, to meet that requirement. One of the challenges uh, throughout the life cycle of geospatial information has been uh, a challenge of integrating data. Um, in our system in the United States uh, Census Bureau, um, we basically are a data aggregator and then we integrate that data into a single database uh, for geospatial purposes. Uh, going through that data integration process uh, and, and, and looking at the sources for where we get that data, that data comes to us from in the case of the address list, the Postal Service, as well as from the state, local, and tribal governments. The road data also comes from the state, local, and tribal governments. And the boundaries come from the state, local, and tribal governments. So how do you integrate all of that information? Um, we've been looking for tools uh, throughout time, and, and uh, several organizations have developed their own tools to the greatest extent, same as, as the Census Bureau. We've developed our own tools to try to integrate that data, but it's a very manual process. It takes a long time to deal with that level of data. Um, 
So uh, there are uh, technologies now that are coming online that are starting to automate that process and make that a much more streamlined activity. And I think it really comes down to how one manages the geospatial data. And so tools like those that are offered by One Spatial are helping to uh, make that a, a, a viable option now as we move forward into this massive uh, data management responsibility. Uh, one of the things that we learned in our in engagement with One Spatial over the years has been that uh, the approach for uh, how we go about our data management uh, is different than what we've done in the past. And so I think that we're seeing some real improvements in uh, streamlining our processes. Um, we have be been able to manage our data in a more efficient and effective way. And I think that at the end of the day, that helps in meeting the objectives that uh, we talked about, benefits coming forward in the 2020 census. Everything we do in the census uh, has some type of geographic component to it. There are 34 different operations in the census, and most of those uh, are dependent on geography uh, that we manage in the geography division uh, to, con to conduct our work. And so having a good data management plan and affecting that plan uh, as we conduct each of the separate geographic operations that we have are critical to the success of the 2020 census.